Hi there. If you're watching this, it means you existingly care for or may soon care for patients in our ICUs. As such, it's important that you understand the principles that underlie analgesia and sedation of our patients. After all, being in the ICU is not often a terribly comfortable experience, and we wish for our patients to be comfortable. However, we also wish to have them sufficiently engaged in their surroundings to avoid delirium, and certainly to be sufficiently awake to be able to spend as few days as possible on the ventilator. And that's a very difficult balance to strike. We are making some changes here at LHSC related to new and evolving evidence and guidelines, and I'm gonna take you through that over the next few minutes. When it comes to ICU sedation, there are obvious patients who must be deeply sedated. We aren't talking about those people. People with open abdomens or people undergoing therapeutic hypothermia after cardiac arrest are not people we're interested in walking the tightrope of fine levels of sedation with. They need deep sedation. We're talking about routinely admitted patients who need to be comfortable enough to tolerate the routine care we provide, including an endotracheal tube, but who also need to be awake enough to be involved in their care and to not spend excessive days on the ventilator due to depressed level of consciousness from sedation we provide. So in general, we can say that deep sedation is out. We're not into that anymore. This is good. Awake patients breathing on their own, engaged in their care. And this is fantastic. A patient who's awake enough that they can mobilize and they can avoid some of the inevitable setbacks that come from receiving intensive care. We know from slightly older literature that routinely screening patients for the ability to breathe spontaneously helps them get off the ventilator. We also know that patients need to be awake in order to have them, have them breathe spontaneously and that interrupting or more likely just maintaining lower doses of sedation will allow us to see if they can breathe spontaneously, creating a favorable cycle of care that involves earlier liberation from mechanical ventilation. So a lightly sedated patient can breathe spontaneously and a patient that can impress us with their spontaneous breathing ability may impress us enough to extubate them. In the newer literature, what we're seeing now is a move toward not using any sedatives as part of caring for these patients. And that's not to imply they're, with, they're not comfortable, we can achieve sedation with analgesics or narcotic medications, as was done in this trial, that demonstrated that their critically ill patients were found to have fewer days on the ventilator when they compared to those who received sedatives. Further, a systematic review and an overview of all the literature in this area more recently identifies improved patient outcomes in those who only receive analgesics, something called analgo sedation, as we'll review again in a few minutes, compared to those who receive sedative hypnotic approaches, so things like benzodiazepines or propofol. Now, the big guidelines are from the SCCM, and they come out every few years, and they came out recently, just last January. In these guidelines, written by a vast number of experts around the world, they make a innumerable number of recommendations. However, some of the most important ones relevant to this talk, I will just share with you briefly now. So they conclude that maintaining light levels of sedation in adult ICU patients is associated with improved clinical outcomes. This should be evident from our discussion only moments ago. They further go on to recommend routine screening of delirium in adult ICU patients, something already in practice at both our sites, thanks to an excellent initiative already in place. They further go on to suggest the avoidance of benzodiazepines and favoring drugs like propofol or dexmedetomidine instead. Benzos are associated with delirium, and delirium is associated with worse outcomes, including death. Very importantly, and perfectly timed for the following slides, they also suggest that an analgesia-first sedation be used in mechanically ventilated adult ICU patients. And this is a concept called analgo sedation. It doesn't really roll off the tongue, but it captures the spirit of what we're going to be talking about. So get to know that word, think about it, stare at it for a moment. There you go. So that concept of analgo sedation will govern our new improved approach to routine sedation of our average patient. Again, not the open abdomens, not the catastrophic traumatic brain injuries, our routine patients. The new preprinted orders, there'll be two sheets. The analgesia sheets will be included in the admission packs. The sedation sheets will not. This will help introduce and nudge us closer toward a analgesia first approach, though using both sets of agents will be of course, acceptable depending on each patient's needs. You'll note that the new preprinted orders will immediately ask for a target mass, which is our 
sedation scoring system, though not one of the most commonly used sedation scoring systems, this motor activity assessment scale does a perfectly fine job of telling us and scoring where patients should be in terms of their level of sedation. And I'll review that score with you in just a moment. But you must assign a destination for us to be able to reach. The physician, the junior resident, the fellow, whoever must assign this. And then you have some ground rules to work with. Within this context, patients will be provided the opportunity for PRN analgesics to get them settled in the early stages of admission when invasive procedures are common, when discomfort may be highest. And if PRN analgesics are insufficient alone, then initiation of infusions to achieve the target mass level after two hours may be instituted. You'll note that narcotic doses in these preprinted orders will be higher than perhaps in the past. However, raising the ceiling on these doses is intended to allow us to use a single therapy when suitable for patients in keeping with the recommendations that I've just reviewed. Now, the motor activity assessment scale is well known to most of the nursing staff and respiratory therapists as it's part of their education. However, many of the junior residents floating through may not be familiar with this scale. It's very important because it allows us all to speak the same language when referring to levels of sedation. You'll note that it's a zero to six scale with zero being deeply comatose and six being dangerously agitated. Three is the sweet spot in the middle where all of us would love to be at all times, calm and cooperative. Now, as mentioned, this sedation strategy is not applicable to those who we wish to be unresponsive and certainly no one wants their patients either agitated or dangerously agitated. So we can remove those from the mix and you're left with scores between one and four. Depending on the patient, depending on their circumstances, you may want a routine sedation, so somebody floating between three and four, or somebody a little bit deeper between one and two. The target score can be changed at any time. Every provider should be familiar with this score before assigning one to a patient. Now, the sedation flow sheet has some significant changes to it. And as mentioned, this will not be routinely included in admission packs for new patients. But when additional sedation beyond analgesics are required, this preprinted order will guide the use of sedative drugs. The major change in this preprinted order is that benzodiazepines have been nearly completely de-emphasized in favor of the use of propofol. And now this does match a lot of our current practice already. However, our current practice doesn't currently match our preprinted orders. In addition to screening with respect to propofol usage and some of its side effect profile regarding hypertriglyceridemia, we also have parameters that describe that we would like to get off infusions of sedation as quickly as we get onto them. Again, target mass is very important. Assigning a propofol dose range with a standardization between both sites of milligrams per kilogram per hour no more of the absolute milligram per hour amounts, and the permission for bolus dose of propofol. If your patient is intolerant to propofol, like profoundly hemodynamically unstable, or has a direct indication for benzodiazepine, such as someone who may be undergoing alcohol withdrawal, then midazolam may be indicated. The governing framework of these two sets of preprinted orders was hatched by a interdisciplinary and cross-city group over the past six months and reflects current practice at leading American centers and the guidelines previously mentioned. Effectively, it's a three-step approach, which I'll review with you now. So step one is going to focus all on the use of analgesics in conjunction with assigning a targeted score. So the default score, as mentioned, is gonna be somewhere between two and four, with three being the sweet spot, and the use of boluses on arrival to the ICU to help get people settled as liberally as you like. Fentanyl is a shorter acting drug than hydromorphone, so fentanyl may be bolused more frequently. Now, if you're still struggling to achieve comfort and your target at the two hour mark, an infusion of analgesics is warranted. Otherwise, the nursing intensity required to continuously bolus people is unjustified. You'll notice the ceiling dose of either 250 micrograms of fentanyl or five milligrams per hour of hydromorphone is higher than previous in that in most cases we expect for the routine patient will allow providers to achieve their target mass score. Now moving on to step two, you're going to see how you're doing. Target check. You're going to see if your pain is well controlled and you've achieved an adequate sedation target. If yes, then you're simply going to regularly review the patient's need for that level of drug and regularly provide SBT as we 
already do to ensure early discontinuation of mechanical ventilation. If you're not at your target score, despite following all the steps in step one, and you're too light, then that you've maximized your dose of analgesics using the highest dose possible. Consider increasing the dose that's in the preprinted orders, so going up to six or eight or 10 of hydromorphone, depending on the patient, or consider non-narcotic analgesics if pain in particular is the problem. If the patient is too deep, so you have a, a mass score of zero or one, for instance, in routine ventilation, then you should probably decrease the dosage, either PRNs or the infusion doses of your drug. Next step, you're gonna move on to step three, and you really only arrive at this step if your analgesics have been maximized and you're still not at target. And in this case, your option primarily is going to be propofol in the dose range of one to five milligrams per kilogram per hour. Or if you must, then midazolam. However, we favor midazolam only in bolus dosing rather than initiating empiric infusions. As mentioned, if they're intolerant to propofol or is suffering alcohol withdrawal, this may favor the choice of midazolam. Once you achieve your target mass score, you'll then be brought back to step two and to enter the cycle of checking your target again, doing routine de-escalation of sedatives and analgesics, as well as assessing if they require increases in your drugs. If ever you can't achieve your target mass, then introducing novel agents or different agents may be required. However, we expect and hope that this protocol will govern the needs of the majority of our patients. That's it for now. Thanks for listening. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me or any of your uh, site leads or educators regarding this protocol.